back up. Okay, uh, please take your seats. You do it. All right. Okay. Uh, really briefly, Cara has uh, a brief announcement, and then we'll get started. My brief announcement is let's give a big hand for Dave Day and for the first session here. <laughs> well done. All right, thank you. We need duplicates for everyone. Okay. So this is the candidate forum for the third district of the Board of Supervisors. Okay. Is everyone uh, everyone settled? If you do have conversations, you know, you can take them outside, we but we're, we're going to get going. We can hear you up here. Yeah. You guys, we can hear you up here talking okay. out Thank there. You. We're supposed to be listening to yeah, them. Yeah, please. Uh, Thank you. You know, if you have conversations, feel free to, to step outside. Okay, so uh, we're going to start this forum with uh, opening statements. Uh, there are going to be three minutes. And uh, after the opening statement, I am going to begin to ask questions. And the questions will uh, go to three candidates will answer the first question. And then three candidates will answer the next question, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I'm going to try to get as many in as possible, because we have a hard out here at 415. OK, so we're going to start here uh, to, my, to my right with John Durant. Well, I, I guess this answers the question, who'd give up a beautiful Saturday afternoon to come here about a supervisor's race? Now, now I see who, who answers that definition. Uh, my name's John Duran. I'm a city council member in the city of West Hollywood. I've been in public office for 14 years, having served as mayor of that city three separate times. And, and I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is our city's economic record. Uh, only 8% of cities in America uh, we're in the black during the Great Recession, and my city was one of those. We didn't have to lay off one employee. We didn't have to cut back one program. In fact, we took advantage of the fact that there were not enough jobs out there for construction workers and contractors to build infrastructure in, in my city. We have a, a AAA bond rating. The county of Los Angeles only has a double A. I think the United States of America has a single A. So we, we've got a AAA bond rating in my city, and, and that's the result of a lot of very fiscally prudent and responsible decisions that the council made. Uh, my city's only 30 years old. I've been on the council for half of the city's lifetime, so I do feel I can take credit for a, a lot of the financial health of my city, having to vote on the budget every year for the last 14 years. I'm a native Angelino. I was uh, born and raised here. Uh, my day job is uh, I'm an attorney, primarily in the criminal justice system. I started out as a civil rights attorney uh, during the early days of the AIDS epidemic. I was an attorney for ACT UP Los Angeles. I was an attorney for the Needle Exchange. I was an attorney for medical marijuana before it became medical marijuana. And so I was always kind of on the left cutting issues out there in terms of uh, civil justice and criminal jurisprudence. A and I, when I ran for public office and, and got elected in 2001, I had an opportunity to do something I think a lot of elected officials would relish, and that's to build a city to take something that was a blighted area of Los Angeles, uh, no economic uh, development, uh, uh, often seen as the backwater uh, of uh, the Hollywood area, sandwiched between Hollywood and Beverly Hills, and to make it one of the most dynamic, interesting communities in Southern California. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to be in this race. I'm sure we're going to get into some of the issues here. Things I care a lot about and I know a lot about, I know a lot about jails, sheriffs, probation, criminal justice, crime, because that's what I do full time for a living, know a lot about the problems in the system. Transportation in a city of 1.9 square miles with 40,000 people, that means I have 20,000 people per mile in my city. We are as dense as parts of Manhattan. That is how dense my city is, so transportation is a huge issue for my city and will be for me on the Board of Supervisors. And finally, upgrading county systems. Most of the Los Angeles County communication systems, infrastructure, were developed in the 1970s. They're antiquated. They don't serve the public well. And a major investment has to be made in all of the systems of Los Angeles County. So I look forward to the discussion and look forward to meeting you all. And uh, I'll stop now. And since you gave such a rousing applause to Betsy Butler, I'll say Betsy Butler has endorsed me for what it's worth. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Excellent. Okay, Sheila Kuehl, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate you spending so much of your Saturday listening to people talk about what they're going to do, and in many cases, what they have done. Uh, I'm Sheila Kuehl. I grew up in L.A. Uh, I went to UCLA, and from the moment I... Thank you, Bruins. And I taught at SC. <laughs> oh, okay, no Trojans. Um, and from the moment I started college, I've lived on the West Side. Um, and for 14 years in the legislature, I represented the West Side of LA, as well as the San Fernando Valley. Um, it's really kind of my hood, more than not. Uh, and I, to prove it, no, not to prove it, but I'm very pleased to have been endorsed by Mike Bonin and Bill Rosendahl and Cindy Misikowski and Ruth Galanter and Herb Wesson and Holly Mitchell and anybody else represent you, I, I'm sure they do, but those are the people. Um, I'm very excited to be running for county supervisor because uh, as the chair of the Health and Human Services Committee in Sacramento in the Senate, uh, as the chair of the Natural Resources and Water Committee, as speaker pro tem of the assembly, uh, I spent a lot of time learning about and getting a very deep background in the very things that the county has dominion over. Counties very different from cities. Uh, many of my ballot mates, which is what Eddie Tabash called us when he first ran against me in 94, and I like that. Many of my ballot mates have been on city councils, and it's very good work and very important work. Um, but it really doesn't have the same kind of experience as working on issues of health care, mental health, public health, transportation, environmental protection, and all of the things that the county does. Essentially, a county is the, they don't like to hear me say it this way, but it's actually the lowest level of state government. Whatever the state makes a budget about and gives you orders about, the county carries it out. Think about Medi-Cal. Think about health care for poor people. Think about foster kids. Think about juvenile justice. Um, and the same thing for much of the federal money and federal rules. So the county is much more related to what the state and the federal government do, and that's why I'm running. I want to use the knowledge and understanding that I gained in all those years. When you're termed out, you're not quite ready to go. It's not about being a politician. It's actually about doing public policy. So I would very much appreciate, obviously, your vote today, and even more appreciate your vote on June 3rd. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to go now to Eric Previn. Hello. Greetings. My name is Eric Previn, and I am a resident of Studio City, California. Uh, and about three years ago, I attended a board meeting in connection with uh, an issue that my mother had with uh, the Animal Control Agency. And I, I went down to the Majestic Hall and uh, weighed in um, during public comment briefly. And shortly thereafter, I started to listen to what was at stake here at the County Board of Supervisors on a weekly basis. And uh, I grew concerned, and I went back to the next meeting, and to the next meeting, and to the next meeting. And I started to discover that the public participation piece was broken in our Los Angeles County government. That in fact, after the big presentation at the beginning of the meeting, most participants simply exit very, very quickly. And, um, my friends and my family thought, you know, why is he going so deep into the county's business? Um, and yet, what I came up with was some interesting stories, and one in particular that moved me, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about that one story as an example of why I think I'm a different and very compelling candidate for this job. It had to do in January 2012 with an item that crossed the board's desk about our county golf courses. There are 19 county golf courses, but, but a handful of those golf courses, uh, actually six, were being transferred um, for, given 20 year extensions actually, not transferred, um, to a group called American Golf. This is a group based in Santa Monica. Um, this, this process was taking place, I discovered by looking at it, without competitive bidding. And I thought, that's odd. How could we be giving away these revenue generators for the county without a fair and competitive process? So I looked into it and I did some Public Record Act requests, which was fairly new to me at the time. And I discovered, believe it or not, that uh, a lobbyist by the name of Matt Kanabi, who is the son of a sitting supervisor, Don Kanabi, uh, was taking money from American Golf Corporation during these preceding years and was doing so in a way that was robust, to put it lightly. He took over a half a million dollars 
to get this deal done. And so I was, you know, outraged, and I took it to anybody who would listen, including the media. I, I pushed to the Times and to a group called SoCal Connected at KCET, and I was uh, successful at getting a story going about this that, that talked about the cronyism and the influence in Los Angeles County government, in particular with that group. And so if I'm elected to this office, I want you to understand that I will be the board's, um, in a way, uh, the worst nightmare. Because I will not tolerate, I will not tolerate um, the kinds of backdoor influence peddling that is going on. And it's clear to many of you who I've seen down at uh, the board meetings on your specific issues that I will raise my voice where I see the public's interest is in um, jeopardy or uh, being sidelined, as it often is in the face of more robust special interests. And, uh, you know, I don't think that the county is the state. I think that the county is one of the greatest uh, nets we have for the underprivileged. Yeah, and we're going to, yeah, wrap I'll wrap it up. So I look forward to a spirited debate, and thank you for your attention, inviting me. Thank you. Okay. Bobby Shriver. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Happy Saturday. Uh, I, too, was, uh, as Sheila mentioned, in local government here. I know some of you from that. When I walked in, a young lady down here said to me, yeah, but what did you get done there? You can't really get anything done. So I thought instead of giving, me, giving you my usual thing, I'll tell her what we did in Santa Monica so that you can have confidence that this agency, which is a local government agency, can get something done for you if I'm elected. First thing I found out when I got here was that the water under the Santa Monica Pier was the most polluted water in the state of California. Kind of a wild statement. Come on, Dustin. He's looking at me like, I don't know about that. Young man, you know, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, working with Heal the Bay and a bunch of activists there, we put a measure on the ballot, which was a tax. We passed it, 66.8%. And we put a storm drain under the pier, which has cleaned that water, and it's now not the dirtiest beach in the state anymore. It gets bad from time to time, but it's not the dirtiest beach in the state. Something we did. When I was on the Parks Commission, just before I ran and was elected, the State Parks Commission, I might add, where I was the chair, uh, there was a new governor who wanted to sell the uh, beach club that had been shut down there for 10 years. And I was able to persuade him to wait a little while, and acting again with my council colleagues and the city staff, we were able to find Mrs. Annenberg to give us $27.5 million, and we built the Annenberg Beach Club. It had been a dump, as some of you remember, if you rode your bike there, on the path, you would have seen it. That's built. Third thing, we had a lot of homeless issues in Santa Monica. I got particularly interested in veterans' homelessness uh, and couldn't understand why on the West LA VA, while we were fighting two wars, there were empty buildings where men and women vets could have gone had those buildings been prepared for them, which they were not. I got very interested in that, but I also knew there were a lot of issues right in Santa Monica, and I knew that those, the providers, a lot of the people who worked with the homeless, didn't trust the government. Uh, didn't want to work with anybody from the city. So one day, someone gave me the idea of you should hire Ed Edelman, who had been the supervisor, had this office for this district prior to Zev, and had worked a lot in mental illness. He was a man of tremendous character and judgment and uh, elegance. And the council agreed with my idea to do that. We hired Ed, and Ed was able to persuade many of these providers. That's not me, right? No. Uh, <laughs> that they should do, for example, feeding of homeless people indoors, which is important because when they're indoors and they get the sandwich, you can develop a relationship with them if you're a social worker. You can't do that in the park if they run off. So that's another thing that happened. Uh, I want you to vote for me in 15 seconds, and I look forward to our conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Okay, and now finally, Pamela Conley uh, Ulich. Is it Ulich? Ulich. Ulich. Can you, can you hear me? All right, I'm going to go from stage left to over here because right, I want to say hi to my colleagues. Um, good afternoon. First, thank you for being here because you could be anywhere today. So I want to thank you because there's a few of us left. And uh, introduce myself. My name is Pamela conley Ulick. I am a, um, my history is I was born in Kansas. I moved to California when I was 18. I went to UCSD um, back when it was affordable, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I was raised in the days when a working class, middle class family could make ends meet. And unfortunately, we look out here today and we see a lot of people that aren't able to make ends meet. So I'm hoping if I'm elected, I can help with my background from being there and doing that. I actually served, I was um, 
litigation supervisor for the Screen Actors Guild Union and for the Directors Guild. My father was a union organizer as well. And after I had my two beautiful children, after 9-11, I kind of reevaluated my life a little, and I asked to go part-time. And I was denied and told it would be a dangerous precedent if I went part-time, everyone would want to go. So I had to make a choice between my children and my career, and I chose my children, my son who's back there today, is, and my daughter who's 14. They are my guiding posts of my life. And I am here today by accident. I started um, being a stay-at-home mom in Malibu. I actually taught labor law at Pepperdine Law School as well. Started to take my kids to the library. And one of the things I noticed is our library didn't have a lot of good facilities for kids. We didn't even have chairs for kids. And then one of my friends who was the librarian at Malibu Library, the children's librarian, moved to Agora. And when I went to Agora Library, I noticed they had a gazebo, they had children's sections, they even had children's computers. And I thought, why isn't Malibu doing this? So I came back home, started to get involved, and asked a politician, like, can you make this an issue? Oh, there was an election coming up, and I took him out, and I said, look, I'm interested in working on this issue in the library, and there's an election what do you think? Should I bring this up? And he said, oh, honey, you should stay at home, bake cookies, because you will lose the election. Of huh. course, the next day I took out papers, and the rest is history. I won the first race in 2004, barely beating our first mayor, Walt Keller, by 60 votes. Uh, subsequent to that, I won the 2008 election. I was the highest vote getter. And what did I do while I was there? Well, it took us eight years, but we improved our library. In addition, the liquefied natural gas terminal, they wanted to put it outside the coast of Malibu. Have you, any of you heard about that? It was basically on steroids. It was scary. So one of my first actions was to support that movement to oppose the liquefied natural gas terminal. Thank you. And we, we didn't do it alone. It wasn't just Malibu. We had to work with Oxnard and all the people up and down the coast, and we were able to defeat it. And it is histori history now, but it was almost approved. The governor was in favor of it, so we were very lucky. We also opposed the next BHP um, Woodside Natural Gas tried to put one, so I helped work on that while I was the mayor. Marsha Hanskins out there. We all know the lagoon. Um, originally, the city council supported okay. it. We ended up um, voting against it, but that was too late, and so am I. So thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. All right. You can hold on to that. Okay, so how this is going to work is I'm going to ask a question, and three of you are going to answer that question, and then we're going to move on to the next one. I've done the math. If I do this right, you'll all get the same amount of questions. Okay. So uh, we're going to start with Sheila. And the first question is, uh, despite the success of the Affordable Care Act, there, there remain, uh, according to estimates, there will remain one million uninsured residents in Los Angeles County due to various restrictions in the federal law, particularly around undocumented individuals. Most of them will be unable to get covered through the exchanges. Uh, the county is committed to finding a solution to cover these people, but they haven't fully determined what form that is going to take. So what is your plan for covering the uninsured in Los Angeles County? Well, I think... Uh, a minute the, and a half, by the way. A minute and a half, yes. How will you save the world? You have a minute and, <laughs> minute and 20 and seconds. 90 seconds. Uh, well, as the author of the uh, single-payer bill that got to the governor's desk twice, um, <laughs> this is an area that I've done a lot of thinking about, and I think... The county is committed to covering all of its residents, including those who do not have access to Obamacare insurance. Uh, one of the ways it already has committed money to doing this in the past, they want to move everybody into managed care. It's not an area that I have been real supportive of, but it is an area that has shown in many ways some efficiencies and some of the efficiencies that we built into the single payer bill. So, uh, I think the county can cover them. I think that in, with a combination of what the managed care group that Mitchell Katz was talking about and you read about in the Times yesterday, uh, two days ago, and LA Care, which is a public-private partnership, uh, which has the ability, it's part of the exchange, to include people because some of the undocumented can actually afford to contribute to their own care. Sure. They simply aren't able to report their income. But if they self-report, they can pay for their own care, and this is what we wanted to do with uh, the state uh, plan as well. So I'm committed to having every single person in Los Angeles County have access to affordable and quality health care, and I think we can do it. Eric, we're going to go to you next. 
Yeah, uh, Tuesday at the board meeting, Mitch Katz gave a very exciting um, but incomplete, obviously, report on the Affordable Care Act and how it's being rolled out right now. But as Sheila mentioned, uh, the thing that is most critical is we are trying to devise a system whereby patients do not go to the emergency room unless there is an absolute need to go to the emergency room. And the way he's devised, which I think people are lining up behind, is something called creating a medical home. Now, the medical home, which we should get a nice theme song and roll out in the form of a campaign, is basically common sense where if somebody has, for example, a fever, we do not want that person in clogging up an emergency room. We want them finding the appropriate clinic or community partner that can provide their level of care that's appropriate. Um, by finding these efficiencies, uh, we will to go a long way in the direction of, of supporting that million uh, individuals who we're expecting to, to be exposed here. And I think that um, you know, the Board of Supervisors is uniquely positioned to include the public in this process. And historically, we have unfortunately rolled back, last year, we've rolled back the reports about how the statistics are in our hospitals, uh, because they're not necessarily something we want to advertise, while we prepare to market, something we do want to do, how good county care can be. So I think that that tension um, will, be, will benefit from transparency, and I think that the Board uh, is going to take a leading, I think we should reinstate the monthly reports uh, to the board on how it's going in our hospital system. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Bobby? We'll go to you. Yeah, we're just going to go down to you. Three, yeah. Um, I think some very good things have been said here. I would say one thing about Dr. Katz, who's been mentioned by both people. This is one of the most important things your supervisor can do, which is to hire very smart people. It's a very important quality uh, in the supervisor, and I think an underappreciated one. If you've had experience in picking very smart people, it's a huge advantage. I say that not only because it's true, but because I've had some of that kind of experience in running various uh, public health nonprofits throughout the world and uh, local nonprofits. It's very, very important. Dr. Katz, the man that's been mentioned, is going to change up health care in Los Angeles County in a very dramatic way. He's done it in San Francisco. He's an extremely smart fellow. He is a very highly motivated person. He really cares about uh, uninsured people and, and giving access to the best care to people. So he's an immense asset of our entire community. Second thought, the most uh, smartest, in my opinion anyway, place to put clinics is at schools. If you can build a small clinic in a school that gives preventive care, this is happening in the private sector in a very big way. Large companies are building small healthcare clinics on their property, which decreases their insurance costs, makes their uh, employees much healthier. We should be doing that exact same thing in the public system. Schools are a great place for that, particularly middle school. It gets the kids in the habit. It gets the parents in the habit of bringing the kids to the doctor. And if the parents are also treatable there, it's a tremendous win. Thank you. Okay, so new question for, for you, Pamela. Uh, do you support an extension of Measure R on the ballot in 2016? And with or without that extra revenue, what is your vision for public transit in the region, especially here on the west side? Yeah, I think Measure R, as we all know, is for transportation. And it infused billions of dollars into Los Angeles economy, and that's why we're getting subways. Hopefully, we'll get the one finished here to Santa Monica soon. Um, one of the, my concerns, though, is that they, uh, the, the Japanese company that the LA County and the board hired um, was not able to complete those cars. And so that's something we have to look at because they, we may have the, the, the rails there and we won't have any cars to get people. So that needs to be looked at and addressed. I'm hoping if I serve on the LA County Board of Supervisors, that won't happen. Um, I, I would support another tax, however, I think it's going to be us talking to all the people. We have to work on it together because this is a two-thirds issue, so we're going to have to get the support out there. But every day, if you go out in your car, it, traffic affects all of us. It is driving us all a little batty. So we have got to address it, if nothing else, but for our mental health issues as well. Um, one of the things I've seen is PCH. We have one way in and out. Sometimes when it's closed down, there's no apparent reason. I won't mention a certain fundraiser at one point, but these <laughs> kind of things have got to stop. It's insane. We have got to work to keep 
traffic moving. We have got to have alternative transportation. I like the safe bike lanes idea, tomorrow Ciclavia. I hope you can all join it. It's on Wilshire. And let's get out of our cars, too. So we have to think 10 years out. When, God forbid, there's not enough fossil fuels to, for our cars to keep going, or our electric cars, we've got to think beyond the car, and we've got to get out on our bikes as well. So hopefully we'll be able to Great. do that. Thank you. John? Trans yes, I do support extension of Measure R. My, my city actually voted overwhelmingly for Measures R and J, and, and there's a reason for that. We're a city of urbanites. When I travel to New York or Chicago or the Bay Area or Paris or anywhere in the world, I have no hesitation hopping on a subway. It's not a scary thing to me to think about getting on a subway. And, and, and so I know that people in Los Angeles who also travel a great deal would be willing to do it if the system worked. And the problem has been over the last 20 years in the rolling out of our, our urban uh, light and heavy rail systems is too many political compromises have been made in the process. There's no reason why we should not have a stop directly at LAX. It's just irrational to think that we would not have a stop at LAX to move people in and out. There's absolutely no reason why the Green Line shouldn't connect to the Norwalk station completely so that people taking trains up from San Diego have the ability to get on the metro. But out of political compromise, a lot of the, uh, the connectors that should have been in place were not put into place. Anytime you're talking about subways, the other issue has to be thinking about parking. Unless you attach parking to metro stops, people are not going to be willing to abandon their cars. When I take the red line occasionally at Hollywood and Highland to get downtown, it will take me 20 minutes to park my car and then another 35 to get downtown. I have saved no time by taking the metro. In fact, I've lost time. And so in my city, we are constructing uh, the first robo garage, a uh, second actually in the, in the state, that people can pull their cars right up, leave your car keys and go. People in LA know what valet parking feels like. And until we've solved the parking problem attached to the metro stations, people won't use it. Thank you. Right. Chill? Um, I do support Measure R. I supported the original one. I supported the uh, extension that failed by only a few votes. Uh, and there are several things that I think we have to include in order for two things. One is to have a good connected grid in the county, and the other is to get the votes that we need for Measure R. Uh, for our uh, population on the west side, I think it's really incumbent that we get our uh, light rail down Wilshire, uh, and we will. It's in the plan. It's in the funding plan already. Uh, one of the interesting things that's going to happen is to see what happens when it tunnels through the tar pits, because they already found an entire mammoth skeleton uh, in the uh, parking lot of the May Company, which they just were digging up. So that's going to be interesting. But that gives us lots of east-west not very much north-south. And in LA County, we really need the north-south. To get the votes of people in the valley, which is a lot of votes needed for Measure R, what they want is a line under the Sepulveda Pass and through it all the way to the airport. I favor that. I think that would be wonderful for us as well. It'll connect to the VA terminal and it'll get to the airport. So also, the Crenshaw Line, the Green Line, and the Sepulveda Line can come to the airport but I think to the airport, not into the airport, which costs $3 billion extra. What we can do is end it very near Terminal 1 or Terminal 7 and have a people mover around the airport. Check in, get your seat, get on the people mover, save $3 billion. All right. Thank you. Okay, so new question starting with you, Eric. Uh, the Brentwood VA facility is located in the district. Uh, it was deeded to the U.S. government to care for veterans. Uh, there have been uh, many efforts around uh, providing services there at, this, at, the, at the facility, but portions of the property have been leased to the private sector. There's talk of putting a metro station on the property as well. What actions do you support to maintain the VA facility, and uh, what kind of use would you want to prevent in terms of development at that facility? Okay. The, hello? Yes. Yes. Um, this is not my area of expertise, just right up front, but I do want to say that I'm very familiar with the facility, and I am, I am pained by how long it has taken to provide something on that land that is meaningful and helpful to the veterans. We have seen countless iterations fail, and some of the people on this very panel have tried hard to find the kinds of sticky, um, you know, services, activities, and things that would be beneficial to that group. Now, 
Uh, we have seen also in the recent past the Board of Supervisors embarked on a program for uh, another veteran related property called the Bob Hope Patriotic Hall, which resulted in a, what can only be described as a $48 million uh, excessive failed project. We, it took multiple years, there were overages up the yin yang, and in the end, this is not really about services to veterans, this is about you know, it was intended in part as a stimulus program, which I supported because we wanted to put people to work during a tough economy. But what resulted uh, was an egregious amount of waste in our public works group. And I have uh, engaged regularly with the public works group on ways to, to put the money on the screen as an entertainment industry term. It means make it really valuable to the people who deserve and need that um, money. And in, in the Veterans Administration, I think we really have to do a better job, and I would be a tireless advocate for making it work. So thank you. Thank you. Bob. So uh, this is the thing I've worked hardest on, this uh, question for the last 10 years. When I first ran in Santa Monica, I was, take, I was walked from the New Directions building up to the empty three buildings that are the subject of our lawsuit and shown that they were empty by one of the co-founders of New Directions. And I foolishly thought it would be a simple thing while we were fighting two wars to persuade the federal government to rehab those buildings and allow vets to go in there, including women combat vets. We have the first generation of women combat vets in the history of our country, many of them living in cars with kids. I was completely wrong about that. It took me 10 years, and only two and a half months ago did, uh, is there a proposal now to change the legislation that had prevented homeless service providers for veterans from using those buildings. There was legislation that prevented them from doing that, federal legislation. The, the long story of how we got to that, I don't want to bore everybody with, but it took 10 years. And I would say to you that uh, that's all online and you can check it out. It's an example of my persistence. I saw that there was a problem there. And even though I tried over and over again in negotiating and letter writing and visiting people in Washington who rebuffed me, I stayed with it. After a while, I got so frustrated, I did organize a lawsuit. We got the right lawyers together to work on the lawsuit, and we won that part of the lawsuit that caused the legislation to change. So I'm very familiar with this. It's a deep outrage that the, of everybody in the community that these vets are still living in dumpsters and under the freeways, but we're going to fix it. You know, I wanted to defer to um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Shriver, and commend you because what you did for the last 10 years is incredible. And I, th I commend you, and so if I got elected, I would consult with you on that project. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I can just defer the rest of my time to him. I mean, I would be proactive, and I think um, you are to be commended for that, and I applaud that, and I would be also looking at, looking at how we could get transportation there as well and services, medical services, if we can coordinate to do some mobile units perhaps. A lot of the vets, as you said, were homeless. They need some health care issues taken care of as well. We need to be proactive and to get these, nip these issues in the bud before a cut on the leg turns into gangrene. So we need to be also looking not just at the way we house them, but the health care facility, facilities, mental health facilities as well. But I want to applaud you, and I'll give you the remainder. I'll give you my 30 seconds if you want anything else to say. And if not, we need to get out. I need yeah, to get out of here. My son's going to move on. <laughs> okay.